Good evening and welcome to our mini medical school session this evening, which is First Responders Saving Lives When Minutes Matter. I'm Dr. Susan Reed. I'm professor of obstetrics and gynecology with an adjunct in epidemiology at the University of Washington and chief of service of OBGYN at Harborview. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, my Harborview colleagues uh, with an amazing story to tell about an institution within our community that those of us that work at Harborview are very, very proud and I think our community should uh, also be proud of the individuals that have built uh, the kind of programs that you're going to hear about tonight and uh, to hear about the kinds of work that the folks at Harborview are doing. Harborview is uh, uh, one of the premier trauma programs across the country, certainly uh, in the top 10th percentile as far as quality of care and uh, one of the top five institutions as far as volume. So we have a number of very unique training programs and we're going to see uh, our group tonight tell us more about that and a, a lot of unique uh, programs that uh, are life-saving. So our first speaker tonight is uh, Dr. David Carlbaum. He's an associate, associate professor in pulmonary, pulmonary and critical care medicine at the University of Washington. He's director of the UW Harborview Paramedic Training Program. He teaches resuscitation and is a regional expert on sepsis and post-resuscitation care and has many publications on airway education, that's like airway, call it airway management, sepsis, and therapeutic hypothermia. He's been uh, uh, an important developer of the sepsis care uh, pathways in our emergency room uh, at Harborview today. He's recognized as a clinical and education leader for our students, uh, residents, fellows, nurses, and paramedic colleagues. Here is David. It looks like, where are you, David? Uh, Whistler, Winter Olympics, watching my favorite sport, biathlon. Nice. And Kyoto teaching. Excellent. There you go. So he's uh, done international travel teaching, and you can see him here. Uh, um, in Kyoto. He, his research interests include non-invasive measurement of perfusion, which means our cardiovascular system and shock states, barriers of implementation of critical care in the emergency room, paramedic performance of critical care, and we're going to see some of a, a demonstration of that uh, here this evening, best methods for teaching assessment and therapy of critically ill patients. He earned his medical degree from the University of Washington, completed his internship and residency at the University of Colorado Medical School. He's a pulmonary and critical care fellow at the University of Washington. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Carlbaum. Thank you. Good evening, my name is David Carlbaum, uh, and I'm, I have an admission to make I'm a failed paramedic. Uh, I, I'm a doctor, but honestly, I would really rather be a paramedic because they have a better job. Um, let me tell you a couple disclosures. So I have no financial disclosures to tell you. I don't own stock in paramedicine. Um, but I do have some disclosures about bias, and that is that I believe that EMTs and paramedics can be trained to perform advanced care. They can be trained to do what a doctor would do in the streets outside the hospital. And I also believe that cardiac arrest, especially in our community, is a survivable event. So let's begin with a little bit of history. So before 1970, does anyone, there's a few people who are a little older than me who might remember what emergency medical services was like, right? So funeral homes ran ambulances, seems like a conflict of interest, uh, and transported patients to the hospital. If you were sick, there was no 911. So you flip through the phone booth and in the front there are a list of 25 ambulance companies and you kind of chose your favorite and they would come and they would drive quickly to your house and the only medicine they would give you is gasoline. They'd put you in the ambulance and drive fast. <laughs> in 1969 and 1970, a cardiologist based at um, Harborview by the name of Leonard Cobb uh, worked to secure federal funding, uh, a research project, a one-year pilot project 
that was designed to answer two questions. Can non-physicians be trained to provide advanced life support care, ALS care, and can we save lives? Pretty simple questions. And so he went to the fire chief at the time, uh, a very conservative Dane, and said, you know, some of this stuff in the streets, this medicine in the streets can be done by monkeys. It's pretty straightforward. You know, start IVs, give some medicines, give some adrenaline or epinephrine to restart people's hearts. And the fire chief said, you know, I have a thousand monkeys. They're called firefighters, and let's try it. <laughs> so the first class was trained, and you can see here, this is the first class uh, graduated. This is uh, 45 years ago, almost to the day. Um, and the wives of the, par of the firefighters and then paramedics were, you know, like most wives, ran the house. Um, and the wife said, you know, this stuff you guys are learning, CPR, it looks pretty easy. I think we could do it. And there's only a few of you, but look at all the citizens. So why don't you guys just teach us how to do it? It looks pretty straightforward. Um, and that was called Medic 2. And here you see a rotary meeting with um, uh, Dr. Cobb here, Dr. Sampson, who's a cardiologist here at the University of Washington, the fire chief, Chief Vickery, and I'm not sure who that is. It may be a cardiologist um, named Dr. Short, uh, working on how do we train the community. And so at the same time we were getting paramedics, advanced care, we were training everybody in the community in evening sessions, cookies served, uh, CPR. So our community is pretty unique. What do paramedics do and EMTs do? Well, they take care of time critical diseases, right? They're sort of agents of public health who come to your house when you need help. Um, cardiac arrest, myocardial infarction or heart attack, stroke, very time critical disease, respiratory failure, so having pneumonia and septic shock from overwhelming infection and not being able to ox get oxygen into your blood. Trauma, right? Trauma used to be a pretty fatal disease. Um, and sepsis. So here you can see a paramedic and his partner working with a nice woman, uh, sort of taking a history, just like you would when you go to the doctor. There's many facets to how this works. Um, and I thought I'd just sort of expand on a couple of these. So I think first off and most important is we have a culture of excellence in our city. So if you go to a firefighter anywhere in King County, anywhere in some of the surrounding counties and say, is cardiac arrest survivable or not survivable? They're going to say, it's totally survivable. No one dies. Eh, yeah, they don't have a heartbeat for a few minutes when we get there, but we'll take care of that. No big deal. Right? So there's that culture of success. Um, training. Our training is very different. We're going to delve into that. Um, we train uh, paramedics in the same way that physicians are trained. Right? Very time intensive. Uh, negative model of training, right, where you learn from your mistakes and you grow. Um, leadership, right, so we view paramedics as leaders, and we'll talk about why here in a second. Research is another big key, right? University of Washington is one of the biggest research uh, academic uh, medical schools in the country, and we value research. So we do research in the streets. Many, numerous studies, I think almost 50 studies have been done in the streets, and it still is ongoing. Dr. Bolger has a study starting this fall that the paramedics will enact. And then funding. Our paramedics get trained for free because of you. Seems crazy, right? It's not government supported, it's supported by donations. So that one year grant in 1971 expired. And the city didn't really have much money at that point, um, especially for a nascent program. And so they went to the community and they raised funds. And we do that through uh, what's called the Medic One Foundation. And if you're interested, they have a great website, wonderful people. And they allow each of our students, it costs about $20,000 for a year of education for a paramedic student, and they fund that student's education. Not to say there's not sacrifice by the student, right, in time, by their home agency, so they're leaving as a firefighter and going to school for a year, and someone has to work for them, so that's expensive, um, but their tuition is covered. And then our, our culture, sort of reflecting our culture of excellence is our motto of measurement and improvement. We're sort of a Scandinavian town, right? Seattle is initially, um, and we're becoming much more international now, which is fun. But really, we're sort of measured people, right? We're not kind of brash East Coast people. We're kind of quiet, <laughs> thoughtful people. Tend to make a little step and reassess, right? Maybe you encounter this frustration in traffic. but. <laughs> um, but that's how we work, right? We, we make a small change and we, we measure, we make an improvement, we remeasure and see if we're going in the right direction. So let's talk about training. Uh, our education model is to teach medicine, leadership, how do you stand at the side of a dying person, 
and have a team of people do what you want, and self-discipline. How do you stand at the side of a dying person and not freak out? Um, and so we have some unique aspects. We have closed admission. Usual paramedic training is for 19-year-olds who are good with their hands and like to work outside, but don't want to do construction, and so they go to community college for 600 hours. They do some time in the emergency department of the local hospital. They ride and take care of some patients and learn the craft. Um, but they don't really have a lot of experience. So we only take people who have had experience. Um, we have uh, adult learners, right? I think the average age of our class is like 32, 35, so they're mature. We use physicians to teach, so senior physicians. So Dr. Bolger, who's speaking next hour, is one of our key teachers. He teaches our trauma section. We use a lot of simulation, um, which you'll see here shortly, and we have a pretty robust field internship. And by that, I mean the students start working in the streets on the second day of their 10-month education. As soon as they have their shots and learn a little bit of safety things so they don't get killed, we put them on the streets. That said, and they'll tell you, they're a little bit useless on the first couple days, right? They're really good at carrying the kits and starting to learn the routine, learn the rhythm of medicine in the streets. And in the end, our goal is that they have about 1,000 patient contacts. 300 of those are as the leader, as the senior paramedic in charge. They supervise about 15 cardiac arrests, uh, start hopefully about 500 IVs. Um, they're, this group may be a little behind, I'm not sure, I haven't looked recently. Intubate about 45 people, and that means putting a breathing tube in, a skill that emergency physicians and anesthesiologists and critical care physicians do. Um, the national standard is about two, so they're really getting a lot of experience. And start about 10 what we call central IVs, so IVs under the collarbone um, when someone has no veins. A lot of experience. We've been using simulation. Simulation is kind of cool, right? It's the exciting hot topic right now. We've been using simulation since 1972, before it was a fad. Um, they actually built the second ICU in Seattle in some old space at the Seattle Center and used that space to train some of the early paramedic classes. And our goal for simulation is to simulate the paramedic's work. And you can see here one of our paramedic students from last year caring for a trauma pl a patient. And here are two students also caring for a trauma patient. And our goal, honestly, is to give them a challenge that's harder than the challenge they usually face in their day-to-day -day work. So when they do face that challenge, you know, once or twice or three times in their career, they've kind of been there. And it's not quite so unfamiliar, right? They have a sense of where, where, uh, how, to, how to react to that. In our system, we choose cardiac arrest as the gold standard for performance. Right, because there's lots of things we do, but measuring impact is really pretty straightforward in cardiac arrest, right? There's two outcomes, alive and dead, and so it's a pretty easy measurement. Um, but it's the ultimate test for an EMS system, right? There have to be multiple layers at work. So the citizens, you, have to do CPR, right? That's really important. The dispatchers have to identify the cardiac arrest right away, have to get a defibrillator to the patient's side right away provide ALS care, and then provide advanced hospital care. Why does time matter in this disease? Well, every minute that goes by in cardiac arrest, if someone's in a particular rhythm called ventricular fibrillation, where the heart's just quivering and not pumping, every minute that goes by, survival goes down, right? Here, this is hospital data, not pre-hospital data, but hospital data, survival, if you can be defibrillated or have an electrical shock applied, in that first minute, survival is 40%. Wait five more minutes to to greater than six minutes, and it goes down to 14%. Time matters. Okay, pop quiz. You didn't know there was gonna be a quiz, did you? <laughs> so, time matters, and we need to get defibrillators and maybe paramedics to people's sides. So how did you do it? Paramedic every Starbucks, <laughs> paramedic on every fire department vehicle, maybe a tiered response with fewer paramedics, or no paramedics, just drive fast, <laughs> right? That's kind of that you know, pre-1970 model. What do you guys think? Raise your hands for one. <laughs> yeah, you would think corporate. Two, pretty common model, right? Yeah, that seems to kind of make sense, right? Three, got a few, a few people here. A few people who say, you know, I kind of want that experience concentrated. What about four? They're doing it in some cities, right? Brooklyn, New York, it's a borough of New York City. Paramedics are not dispatched on trauma. They tell the EMTs just drive fast. Interesting. How about here? Well, we use a tiered response, right? 
And it has to do with the same reason that if you go to a surgeon, you want your surgeon to have done that procedure 100 times before you meet them, right? There's a volume outcome relationship. So if, you, if we think about survival from cardiac arrest, right, this is number of paramedics per capita. You'd think more would be better. But actually, if all these cities, here's Seattle, this is old data, this is 10-year-old data, here's Seattle. But the more paramedics you have, the worse your hospital survival from up here at about 46% down to about 2%, right? Why is that? What do you guys think? Be brave. Yeah, so the fewer you have, good answer, the fewer you, if you have fewer, they're more experienced. So these paramedics here maybe see a cardiac arrest once a year, maybe once every other year. These paramedics up here at least once a month, right? Experience matters. So our tiered system begins with the phone call, right? So the telecommunicator, what we used to call dispatchers, identifies the location and asks two very simple questions. Is the patient conscious and awake? and are they breathing normally? If you say no to both, then we presume that's a cardiac arrest and we start giving you instructions on how to do CPR. Which, by the way, is probably the foundation to good care. Right? If the citizen does CPR, the patient's chance of survival is five-fold greater. It matters. Right? So if, you don't, if you're sitting here and you don't know CPR, go learn. It's easy, totally easy. The first tier of responders are what we call basic life support or EMTs. They're firefighters in our city. We send a fair number of people. We send the two closest fire units, which gives you eight personnel. We're going to use a, few, a little bit less today when we do a demonstration. And they provide high performance CPR, continuous chest compressions, right, and rapid defibrillation. They bring that defibrillator. What used to be a paramedic skill, well, actually kind of anybody can do it. We teach it in King County to seventh, eighth graders, and I think again in high school. Right? Ten-year-olds can do this. It's very straightforward. This, the next response is the paramedics, that advanced life support layer. So two paramedics. Most cities have just one paramedic, right? Paramedics are a little bit expensive. They're, they have more training. Two together, because we think two brains are better than one. They bring ICU-level medications. So they do what an emergency physician or a critical care physician like me or what an anesthesiologist would do in the streets. And in what around the world we actually use physicians to do, we do with paramedics. The other unique thing is instead of having a protocol book of things to do, they actually talk to a physician and discuss the case. You know, Doc, we're seeing a 48-year-old female who's having crushing substernal chest pain that radiates to her jaw. She's diaphoretic. You know, on physical exam, here's what I see. I did a 12-lead EKG, and she's having a ST elevation myocardial infarction. She's having a heart attack. I'd like to treat her with this, this, and this, and take her to the closest cath lab. Right? They discuss that case with the physician. So I thought, what better way, you know, me talking kind of gets after this a little bit, but why don't we um, show you guys what it's like? So we're going to do a little bit of a demonstration. So I'm going to bring up my dispatcher. I'm going to take off my jacket because uh, I'm about to do some CPR, I think. I'm, I'm not sure, but I think that's about to happen. Um, let me get my phone. I'm going to cheat for a second. This is Norm Nadell. He's a retired paramedic who's my curriculum director for paramedic training. And he's also, can I call you a telecommunicator or a dispatcher? I was a dispatcher. He's a dispatcher. Um, the newfangled term is not, you know, lots of tradition in the fire department. OK, so uh, I, here I am in, um, where are we? Hogness, Hogness Auditorium. Uh, and I meet this nice woman who's kind of looks sick. She's pale, she's sweaty. And, uh, and she's not doing great. Ma'am, ma'am, are you okay? What's going on? And, and ma'am, and she's not talking now at all. <laughs> um, this is bad, so I'm gonna call for help. 911. I'm gonna put on speaker. Hello? Seattle Fire and Medic One, what's the address of the problem? Uh, uh, Ho 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 Hogness, Ho Hogness Auditorium, I'm at the med school. Are you at the University of Washington, sir? Yes, yeah, okay, uh, but in not health, in the hospital. In the ho health sciences wing? Yeah. It's You're in Hogness Hall? Yeah, A300 or something? Okay, 1959 Northeast Pacific Street. What's that, the problem there today? There's this woman who was really sweaty, and she said her chest hurt, and then she just became unconscious. Is she conscious and awake, sir? No. Is she breathing normally? 
No, she's kind of gasping. Okay, sir, I've got help started. They're on the way. I'm going to tell you what to do until the medics arrive, okay? Uh, Listen okay. carefully to me. Okay. I want you to get her flat on her back on the floor. Okay. Is she flat on her back, sir? Yeah, she looks I want really you to, sick. I want you to put the heel of your hand on the center of her chest. I want you to put your other hand on top of that hand. I want you okay. to push down two inches. I want you to do this quickly, and I want you to count out loud. One and two and one and two and one and two and one and two. Are you sending help? Okay, are you counting for me, two, sir? Count one, out loud. Two, one and two, one and two. Okay, help's on the way, two, sir. I'm hanging up. Keep doing that until the fire department arrives, okay? Time out is 19, 22 hours engine, 17, 38, medic 16. It's a med 7 response to 1959 Northeast Pacific Street in Hogness Hall. Engine 17. Engine 17, responding. Two minutes is a really long time. <laughs> All right, come on. Dispatch engine 17 is on scene. Okay, engine 17. Oh, sorry. Tyler, you want to confirm? Yes, sir, you want to start okay. bagging? Good job. Thank you very much. Just going to go ahead and check, check for a pulse. They're not breathing. I'm going to go ahead and start CPR. All right, start CPR. Evan, hook up the life bag. Got it. Can you start breathing? Yep. Dispatch from engine 17. We have a confirmed cardiac arrest. Engine 17, ongoing CPR. Start CPR. So we got. Two minute timer started. All right, let's start bagging. Evan, you got the patches going on the chest? I do. So a couple of things I noticed, it's pretty quiet. They're not really freaking out. They're doing their job. They have teamwork. So Jason's the officer in charge. He's got his team working. Sir, do you know any medical history on this patient? No, no, I just, she was just sitting in here. You know, sometimes I sit in here after tests when I'm all stressed out and, and I came in and she, she looks really pale and she said her chest hurt all and right. she's really sweaty. Evan, let's look, let's look for any bracelets or anything like that for medical bracelets. No bracelets, no necklace. We can send someone to look for a purse here. Check ephemerals. You're getting good bilateral pulses with compressions. Right. Okay. So Evan, we're going to be coming up on two minutes in about 45 seconds. So let's have you rotate you. through with Tyler. Yep. How's she bagging for you? She's bagging well. Good. Uh, through compliance. Pop that on your glass. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we got 30 seconds left. Perfect. So we do t CPR in two-minute cycles, and then we give them uh, ideally less than 10-second pause after that two minutes. Because they're the BLS, they're using an automatic defibrillator. It's going to take a little bit of time to analyze the patient's heart rhythm and decide if she needs electricity or not. We're still getting good pulses with compressions. Good pulses. All right. So we're coming up to two minutes. We're going to analyze. Okay. Let's hold on compressions. Stand clear. Let's rotate compressors. Analyzing now. Stand clear. All clear. All right, let's charge up, start compressions, 30 more compressions, and then we're going to shock. So it takes a little bit of time for the device to charge, so they're going to prime the heart by doing more CPR. Call it out, Evan. Clear. All right, everyone clear, shocking. Continue compressions. Medic 16 from engine 17. How you doing, John? Medic 16, we have one shock on board. We have a 45-year-old female, two minutes of compressions on board right now. Medic yeah. 16, okay. Sorry, I'm going to take it. Yeah, I'm going to take over bagging. Okay. All right, Good. so you, usually by this time, they'd have a second engine company, so four more people arriving so that they would be able to rotate. Doing good, high-quality CPR is hard work. Good job on compressions, Evan. She's still bagging good? Yep, bagging good. Good for moral policy with CPR. Hi, you guys. Hey, guys. Okay. Tyler, you mind scooting over that see. side for me yep. over there? So we have a 45 year old female. The yeah, monitor. Yeah. We have okay. one shock on board, guys. We're 40 She's seconds really away from our next thank analyze. You. Okay, 45 right. seconds out. So let's keep on bagging. Yes. And working around Your here, time. Okay, sounds good. Yep, we're okay. three. Three, I get three and a half minutes in. Uh, spike yep. a bag here for me. 
Okay, Theron, I'm going to start an IV here in the arm. You're getting airway taken care right, of. So there's okay. a little bit of a handoff going on here, right? You hear a little bit of sort of yeah. some of the subcontractors, okay, right? Okay, so you've got good compressions going on. Okay, so one shock has been applied, correct? Correct. Uh, okay. So the person breathing with the yeah, mask is, is now going to sort of yeah, hand okay, off to going the paramedic like is going to put a breathing tube in. Go ahead and do it now. Hey, Courtney, you mind closing that down there for me again, Terrence? Yeah. This is in part why we have two paramedics. So one paramedic is in charge. So Courtney's in charge. She's starting an IV right, right now. And you've got, keep your hand. You have good uh, pulses with CPR, John? Yeah, we have good femoral pulses with CPR. Okay. And then her partner is going to put a breathing tube into the patient so that if I've got the patient were to vomit, it, it won't So go we are now at two minutes for our next analyze. Okay. And again, we, we have this motto of where we integrate the paramedics into yet, the firefighters. So okay. It will be shocking, this one, if we just see it. Okay, I've got good room. pulses yep. with CPR. Okay, hold CPR. So we use the, the IV. We place okay, the IV I've so we can no give pulses. medications to okay. help. Okay. Bring Everybody the, clear? Uh, Everybody clear. The shock. Blood pressure. Okay. okay, shock. Continue CPR. All right, Tyler. Okay. So I'm gonna work in there. For me to do. Line is ready. Begging. Evan, okay. get them nice and pre-oxygenated. Yep. All right, when I tell you, I'm gonna move in. And take the mask off the bag, okay. and uh, we'll go forth. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Sharp out here. Go ahead and pull out that OPA as well. Okay. Thank you. Open the mouth. Anterior vector. Who's got line? Perfect. Technique. Going I'm past the lips, sugar. past the teeth, okay. marching down the tongue. Looking for the epiglottis. How's my flow on that? See the epiglottis. Okay. I'm going to secure Not this a line. View. So placing the breathing tube like you see Theron doing it, most anesthesiologists will need to stop chest so compressions, the right? We train them to do it without stopping, because stopping chest compressions means no blood flow okay. to the brain. Sell it. We want them to Cal be able to do it. A couple pieces yep. of tape for me there. And am I still good flowing? Still flowing good. Okay, Theron, I've got a good line. Okay. Next round will be, a, if we see VF again, Second we'll be doing an epi, no shock, it'll be epi and Alps okay, for perfect. next intervention here. Can I go ahead and beg for me? Yeah. Right, so working on a little teamwork and good communication between the two of them. Ten seconds away from our next two minutes. And so what Courtney was saying is that she's going to use epinephrine, which raises the blood pressure and stimulates the heart to contract. Can I get somebody to open up next to here for me? So how far out are we in our cycle? Two minutes right now. Okay, two minutes. All right, I'm securing the tube. Okay. Good good pulses with CPR. Okay. Okay, stop, hold CPR. Okay, no pulses. We're in VF still. Okay, I'm going to give 0.5 okay. of Continue epi. CPR. Okay. Right, so she's giving epinephrine. Okay. So, Courtney? 0.5 epi here. Confirm with her partner. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and I get this EJ up here, okay? Okay. So I'm going to turn the head towards you. Okay. And then she's going to give a, okay. an antirhythmic medicine epi. to I'm giving control my this abnormal rhythm. 1A and 1B will be going on. And that's actually a research drug. Yep. 1A is going on. And we call it ALPS because it's one of three drugs, amiodarone, lidocaine, or placebo. So we're doing a, a randomized, blinded okay. trial. So she doesn't know what she's giving. She's giving the study drug. Okay. 0.5 of Alps Epi. Here. Alps here, got 0.5 of Epi. Uh, sharp out. And you're keeping track for yep. me? Okay, perfect. Okay, you've got good CPR. Yeah. we got good femoral pulses. Good pulses. we got a sharp LT. Tubes, good. Thank you. Got I good end title on the monitor, good CPR. So the question was, what, what are the medicines line. in the research study? It's a different you. type of antirhythmic or medicine to control the rhythm of the heart. Flowing good. Good flow. Good flow. Okay. Perfect. Here's some tape for you. So Theron, the okay. paramedic at the head, has decided uh, he saw a great yeah, vein in the patient's neck. So he's going to start a second IV because that you. way if something happens to the first one and comes out, they've got two. Did we get a sugar on this patient? Yeah, too? sugar okay. is 120. Okay, so Theron, next round, if we see VF again, it's going to be a shock round with point with 25 mil equivalents of bicarb. Copy that. Okay. See if you have to so get we shock are round, 15, 15 mil seconds away from our next two minutes. Okay, so I'm going to bump this up to 360. I'm One charging. Okay, I've got really good. Uh, pulses with CPR. Good job on CPR, yep. you guys. Okay. So right. Courtney, two minutes. Time here. Okay. Two minutes. Okay. Hold CPR. We're rotate through yep. compressors. Okay. I don't have pulses. We're gonna shock. Everybody clear? All clear. clear. Everybody clear. Okay. Shocking. Shock. Start CPR. Okay. So Courtney, I have the tube pulses. established. Kay. I got a second line. Would you like me to come over there so you can manage the scene? 
Yeah, let's uh, let me push this 25 mil equivalents okay. of bicarb, so and then I'm nice going to step back. Just like that, okay? And you do that. Perfect. Right. So now that they've got that initial work done, the Theron is the airway paramedic has the breathing tube so, in place. So okay, Cap, I got 25 mil equivalents of bicarb going on. Uh, okay, Theron. Perfect. So I've got 25 left in here, and okay. we've got another 0.5 of epi. Perfect. <laughs> and so they're going to switch good. to that. Courtney can actually just step back and think. Okay. So that she, as the in-charge paramedic, so she doesn't actually have to do next stuff. One that we she can do just be the thinker. The, just epi. We'll do the not till the next one. So the next round's just going to be 0.5 of epi. Okay. One minute out. If we see good. VF again. Okay. Right. I'll get this ready for you. Okay. Perfect. Good compressions. You have good pulse oh, yeah, with CPR? Good pulse with CPR. Okay. How's the tube up there? John, everything okay? Yeah. Good compliance on the breaths. All right. How's our O's? Here, I'm going to leave this out here for you. Right, so they have a this mental checklist. They can hear them going through. Okay. Like, do I have so good pulses with here, CPR? Let me pull that out for do you. I so have easy five. ventilation? Am I getting oxygen in and carbon dioxide Epi. out? 30 seconds till the next intervention. 30 okay. seconds intervention. I'll switch out, Evan. Yep. Okay. Okay, so Theron, we've got a good tube. We've got good equal yep. bilateral lung sounds. We've got good end tidal on the monitor. We've got two lines established. We're into the. We're, you're still seeing VF, so next one will be 0.5 of epi. Okay. Okay. So everything, good. we're good. We're where we need to be right now. Sounds okay. Great. Five seconds till your intervention. Okay. okay. I, got, I got great pulses with CPR. Let me move this out of the way. All right. Time. Yep. Good. Pulse CPR. Clear. Yeah, pulses. No pulses. All right. Go back to CPR. Okay, you guys are switching 0 .5 out. 0.5 milligrams okay, we're good. epi going on board. 0 0.5 epi. Right, so almost less than one second pause. Almost continuous CPR. Good job on the CPR, you guys. Good pulses still? Good for more pulses. Okay. Bagging good? He's bagging well, Evan? Yeah. Compliant. Okay. She's bagging well? Entitled's okay. Good. Okay. Perfect. So, Theron, next intervention. If we see VF again, we will, it'll be a shock round. Yes, it will, yep. Okay. So and a bicarb, we can do the rest of the 25 mil equivalents of bicarb and a shock round. Sounds great, I'll be sure to charge more. Okay. Later. We have one minute. Ava. All right. We do we know? Okay, so time. we don't know. What do so we, we know about this? We have a 45 patient? year old female, no okay. one knows her medical history. She has no bracelets on. Okay. Bystander saw her <clears throat> clutching her chest and she collapsed. She looked, she's pale and diaphoretic on when we arrived. Okay. So this is where we're at right now. 45 okay. years old, no, don't know any history okay. on her. Okay. Got 45 <coughs> seconds out. 45 seconds. Okay, good CPR. So, okay, next so intervention, next we'll rotate we'll through compressions. Yep. I'm thinking about if, you know, if we get pulses back, we'll get backboard and get going. But right now, we'll just shock, see what we have Sounds next. Good, yeah. Okay. Go ahead and play out right, this guys. play. Yeah. Okay. 15 seconds. All right, I'm going to go ahead and charge the monitor. Don't worry, guys, we're just charging. Good pulses with CPR. Good pulses. Right, so the paramedics are not sure. really working on moving the patient to the hospital Ready. right now right, because they have everything they need We're here. We're seeing VF. Right, All right, guys, everyone clear? We're going to shock this? All clear. Clear, shock, back to CPR. Yep. Thank you. They okay. brought the hospital to the patient. All right, Walt's going to give uh, 25 mil so, equivalent to bicarb okay. LT. 25 mil equivalent to bicarb. Good pulses down there with CPR. Pulses, pulses coming back up. Okay. Good pulses. Just want to get my hands on there and feel. Good pulses. Good. Good. Okay. So next round, Theron will analyze. Uh, it'll be our plan, our Alps. Okay. Two for the next round, our next anti dysrhythmic intervention. Okay. I agree. Sounds great. Okay. Good job on compressions. Yeah, you've got good CPR, so we're still we're still good. I'll get on after after this next round. I'll get on the phone with the doctor. Let him know what we have. Oh, is it still awesome. good? Alrighty. All right, great, great compressions there, John. How much time do we have, LT? Got another 30 seconds. Okay. Unlike cardiac arrest in the hospital, this is often quieter, right? The teams know each other, they, and they all have very standard training, right? And a lot of what we focus on okay. is yep. their belief yep. that the Perfect. patient's going to live, right? And their leadership that you're seeing, and their sort of self-discipline. Okay, so... Pulses. Got another 20 okay. seconds. 20 seconds. All right. Left your head on that. Thank you. 
and you're switching out your next up for compressions. Yep. Bagging, still bagging. Still well. bagging, bagging Good well. CPR. 10 okay. seconds. Yeah, Courtney, so I think we're doing everything we can at this moment. Let's yeah. keep uh, going down this plan A and see what happens. Yeah, let's. Intervention. I mean, she's a young woman, 45. Yeah. Full CPR. Sudden cardiac arrest. We've got. Okay. All right, uh, Courtney, we have, we have pulses back. Okay, uh, what do we see on here? About 74. Okay, right. so let's, some, let's get somebody started working on a blood pressure on her, and uh, can we get a, somebody to go out and get a backboard? We'll get yeah. going here to the hospital. Right we you. need to work on a 12 lead, got a backboard. and let's get her going to the hospital. Sounds great. Backboard, gurney. All right, so let's give them a round of applause for their hard work. They're uh, so well trained that they're, uh, they're going to pick up every iota of trash that they have brought, right? <clears throat> Unlike the hospital. So, what did you guys think? Yeah? <clears throat> so maybe let's review a couple of things that happened just so that we all are clear out of the stress and chaos of watching that, right? It raises your heart rate, doesn't it? Um, good, high-quality dispatching, right? Dispatcher identified right away, patients unconscious and not breathing normally. They were still breathing, right? You will still breathe without a pulse for a little while. It sounds very unusual. It's what we call agonal respirations. It's not normal breathing, right? But the dispatcher didn't let that throw them off. They said, sounds like the patient needs CPR. I'm going to teach you how. It wasn't, would you like to help? Would you like to do CPR? It was, I'm teaching you. Like, let's go, right? So good, worked on high quality CPR immediately from the citizen, super important. Increased the survival fivefold. Dispatched enough resources, so eight firefighters, two closest fire engines, um, and the paramedics. So sent a lot of resources. Worked on getting the address, right? I, I, I didn't know the address, but they figured it out. Um, and then sort of high quality continuous CPR by that BLS crew. So we delegate that to that BLS, that firefighter crew. They own the CPR. Paramedics are in charge too. They need to cross check and you saw that, right? That good feedback about rate and depth and you're doing a good job is are you generating a good pulse for the patient because the patient doesn't have a pulse right now. But the firefighters own that. And when the paramedics arrive in lots of systems, the firefighters sort of step back. Okay, you're here, heroes. We're gonna step back because we're kind of scared. We don't give them that option, right? You saw that seamless integration of the ALS and BLS team. The ALS team arrived and sort of went right to work. What's going on? Okay, how's this going? Let me check this, let me check this. I'm gonna work on this. You work on that and we're good to go, right? A little bit of chaos at that handoff and then sort of settled into those roles, right? And they, they both know where they're headed. And the firefighters know where they're headed too. You know, we do this and we do this and we do this, right? It's pretty programmatic, but it provides organization in chaos. So they could do this here, they could do it at Husky Stadium, they could do it in the street. Um, I had the other day a couple of students tell me that they did it in the median somewhere on Roosevelt maybe, I'm not sure, somewhere up north here. Um, they can do it on the freeway where it's noisy and maybe even a little bit more unsafe. So they can work and do what I would do as a doctor if I were there. Parenthetically, they probably do it better than me, right? Because doctors kind of need like teams and support in labs and hospitals and lights, right? You know, if you ask an anesthesiologist to lay on the floor and put a breathing tube in, they'll do it, they can do it, but it's not their usual work environment, right? Usually work standing up and, and with nice, good light. Um, so our community has a pretty unique way of training paramedics. It's pretty different. So, right, they have much more experience, closed admission, a little bit older senior people. Um, we use a tiered response to match resources to patients. Some communities say every single patient who's sick needs a paramedic. In our community, we say, well, you know, if you just have like a broken wrist because you slipped on the ice, you don't really need someone who's an ICU level or emergency physician level trained person. You need a ride. You need someone who can put a cardboard splint on and take you to the hospital, right? And in our Western culture, we tend to use 911 for that. You can use other means for that, right? Um, but that's how we tend to do that. But you don't need that advanced care. So let's save those advanced level skills for the patient that does need it. And let's concentrate those skills in very few people, right? In the city of Seattle right now, there are seven, 
seven medic units right now? So there's only 14 paramedics at work right now in the whole city, right? Paramedic training, we've been training paramedics for 45 years. We've trained 668 paramedics. That's it. For the city of Seattle, that's only about 200 in the 45 year history. So it tells you two things. One, there aren't very many, but two, because it's such a unique position, they tend to work for a long time. A lot of communities, paramedics work for two, three, four years. Our paramedics on average work about 18 years, right? They really gather that experience because they have a great job. They only get to see sick people. They have a pretty hard schedule. They work 24 hour shifts in our community, but they have reasonable time off between their shifts. So it's really hard when you're at work, but they have some good downtime so they can recover and sort of heal from seeing all these sick people. Um, and therefore they last a long time. It's a good investment. Um, I think the big thing that I like to always remember though is that citizens, you, me, are the cornerstone, right? So when you find someone sick, do CPR. If you don't know how, take a class. It's really fun, right? And there's probably some good, important reasons to learn some first aid, right? And I think Dr. Bolger may cover that too, but you should know kind of how to stop bleeding because it's pretty easy to do and you could save someone's life, and that's kind of fun, saving someone's life. Um, so in this graphic, is just to remind me to talk about sort of our system in King County. So this is to 2014 data, so bystander CPR countywide happens about two-thirds of the time. The dispatchers recognize cardiac arrest 96% of the time. They're really good at this. They actually get drilled. We, we call them with sort of fake patients, and they have to figure it out, right? It's pretty tough. Um, the average response time throughout the county is seven and a half minutes. In the city, it's about three and a half minutes for the first um, firefighters to get there, and it's about seven minutes for the paramedics. The EMTs were on the chest doing CPR 88% of the time. Our goal is 96, 98%, so we're working on that. That's really come up a lot. It used to, 10 years ago, it was probably 75%. Really working on that continuous CPR. Successful intubation on the first try in cardiac arrest, 78% in the county. By the third try, 99%. That's hard to put a breathing tube into a moving target, right? Patients getting chest compressions, and you've got to put a tube through a small hole into their trachea. Not easy, trust me. Um, and all that added together gives our community a survival from witnessed ventricular fibrillation cardiac arrest, this type of cardiac arrest we saw, which is usually from heart disease, of 62%. That's actually the best in the world. So you're living in sort of a gifted community where 62% of people who have a cardiac arrest, like our patient today, will walk out of the hospital normal. Very survivable. We're working hard to try to improve that one little step at a time. Measure, improve, measure, improve, right? That's our motto. So um, I want to thank you for allowing us to give you a demo and uh, letting you see this kind of unique facet of our medical school. It's pretty rare that um, paramedic training is integrated into a medical school as closely as we are here in Seattle, and we really appreciate it. And so thanks again for the opportunity. Thanks, Dr. Lee.